My name is Kobna Chenche Hinebot. Many thanks for joining us here on Newsdesk to our very first story. And a person shall not knowingly take any juvenile fish during fishing. Reads a section of the Fisheries Act passed in 2002 to address instances where fishermen harvest fingerlings, an act that depletes the fish stock. Join us is Joseph Akable in this report. Visits Jamestown, a predominantly fishing community, to assess the situation years after the passage of the act. The Asha and James Forts and the Lighthouse, the three imposing structures overlooking the sea that serves many residents in a unique way. Fishing, the livelihood of residents here. One of the many water bodies that provides the protein needs of the people in the form of fish for our meals. For some, it's all about buying it in town, whilst others risk their life, either going out in the morning or in the evening to ensure that they have fish for all of us. A recent report by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization says a third of the world's fish stock have been harvested at biologically unsustainable levels. A situation they fear might deplete the stock. I set out to find out from the fisher folk whether they are worried about this situation. If they think otherwise, how beneficial is harvesting at such levels is to the society. 70-year-old Robert Akins has worked as a fisherman for more than a decade. He loves his work. It provides uh, occupation for the majority of the people. Because it, fishing is their chief occupation in these parts of the, uh, the city. And uh, it provides also income for the women who fry fish and sell fish and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm, so it is very crucial because otherwise uh, there is no job they will do you know, except to go and learn some trade. But the sea is there to provide income for them so long as they are ready to go to fishing. Mm. The livelihood of Robert Akins and his family is now under threat. His colleague fishermen are catching the fingerlings and the ocean is gradually becoming depleted. They, they are not worried about it because uh, they see that the net they use for fishing, there are several sizes, and there is one they have named it Polly. You see, uh, it's very tiny, so a fish that is as small as this, it will be caught. Once government says it should stop, it will cease immediately. It is government that has the power. Government must halt the importation of such nets. The sea is our source of livelihood. We don't protect it, our children will suffer. But not every fisherman here feels the ocean is in danger. The reason why we cannot stop harvesting the fingerlings is because there is a demand. It is used to feed livestock and sometimes doctors recommend for patients to enrich their nutrition, especially for children. But the major problem is the effect of the light that is being used by the fish trawlers for fishing. It destroys the sea and we are worried. Secretary for the Gamashi Cable Fishermen Association, Alfred Lamte, believes the enforcement of the Fishes Act is the we way are to go. At the, 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 the government now to enforce the law. To enforce the law. If the law is being enforced, everything will be. So it, it is causing it now. We are in our harvest uh, season now. You yourself, you can see. There's no fish. There's no fish. So the industry is coming down. Uh, the, the industry is falling. So we, we are appealing. Every day we are appealing to the government to come in to uh, do something for us. Harvesting at such levels is what has caused the decline in marine fish capture, a situation which can be addressed through aquaculture. Dr. Samuel Ado is a lecturer at the University of Ghana Department of Marine and Fisheries. The demand or requirement for fish in the country keeps increasing and it is now beyond you know, the 1 million okay, metric ton mark, whilst total production is still, in fact, below 400,000 metric tons. So the difference of the 600,000 or over 
where do we get it? That is where government has to spend so much money in importing, you know, fish to just supplement the um, requirement. And so here we are saying that aquaculture could bridge, you know, that gap. See, and what is aquaculture? You are doing the farming yourself. There is intervention. There, there is ownership there. So you control, you know, the fish, and then you harvest them at a time, and then at the size that you want, which probably will sell well on the market. More than a decade after the passage of the Fisheries Act, the fight against depletion of our fish stock does not seem to be ending, and a lost battle means the country's ocean on the brink. For Joy News, Joseph Akable. <laughs> Now, commercial production of the country's second biggest oil field, that's the Trinobor and United Tommy, uh, popularly referred to as the 10 fields, is expected to start today. Uh, President John Dramani Mama will formally turn on the production valve on the FPSO water mills to commence production. Well, George Afi is there for joining news and is joining me uh, live via Skype from the FPSO John Evans at Tamils uh, with some more now. Uh, George, uh, if you can see and hear me, good morning. Many thanks for joining us. Well, good morning, and uh, nice to also speak to you right. uh, far away, about 60 kilometers off uh, the shores of uh, the western uh, part of Ghana. Indeed. And on the 10 uh, FPSO, or John Evans Atamo's FPSO. Right. So uh, you could tell us a, a lot more about what, what to expect today. And indeed, you've been, to, uh, uh, you've been on this very FPSO. Uh, tell us what really you see and the anticipation even ahead of the president turning on the valves. So the necessary security checks are being done. Mm -hmm. And if you can uh, see it behind me, this is what they call the bridge, as you can see behind me. Okay. And also, in trying to describe the vessel, it's more about four football pitches that I can say that put together. So to my immediate right, you can see uh, that basically the, the infrastructure is over there. Mm -hmm. and where they are doing the extraction of crude and as we speak right now production is actually going on uh, so what the president will just come and do is more of just symbolic in trying to turn the valves um, what we hear what we understand is that uh, they're doing about uh, twenty-three thousand barrels of crude oil and then they are hoping to increase it as the day goes on so with the president already the vips have arrived uh, early on i don't know whether you saw the videos of the group ceo we have uh, the GRA boards, we have the Petroleum Commission boards, uh, the uh, UK High Commission to Ghana is also John Benjamin is here, as well as the US Ambassador to Ghana is also here. And the necessary finishing touches have been put, security checks have been done as well. And as we speak right now, we're waiting for the President's uh, chopper to land. In the next about 15 minutes, it will land, and then bingo, you go through the necessary briefing, uh, try and turn off the valves, and then we are done for the official commissioning of the commercial oil. In, uh, what we say, commercial marketplace. George, uh, earlier before we came on air, I saw you hanging out with a few of the workers on the FPSO. Uh, what has been their reaction to all of this? And I'm sure there might be also a static. If you could well, even speak to a few more, that, well, that should be well, fine. Well, it, 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 it's more business as usual. And you can mm -hmm. see one of the safety managers around here walking around. If you can see, uh, we are very, very busy as we speak right now. So mm -hmm. it's difficult to. Uh, catch them to speak to them right now. Very, very busy. I can, I can speak right now. Uh, they are all doing the necessary finishing touches, but uh, that is what is going on right here. Uh, as time goes on, I'll try my best and uh, speak to some of them and find out how things are, are going for them. But uh, it's more business as usual, mm. uh, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and ensure that everything is on point to make sure that everything is going right. So I can tell you that everything is very, very smooth here. They are very, very, very excited. I will show you uh, one gentleman who is actually responsible for uh, the chopper, uh, making sure that everything lands very well, everything is straight, and everything is going on as usual as we, as we, speak, as we speak right now. So it's, it's business as usual. As you can see behind me, uh, they are working very, very well for things to be work very well. Indeed. And you can see that he's very, very busy, so he does not have see. a chat with you. Okay, take the chat. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> as you can see, mm. they are all crossing their teeth, dotting their eyes to make sure that this is indeed a successful one. Okay. So, 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 don't talk about speaking to you. George, just to find out, uh, again, we need to reiterate this. Uh, how important is this entire uh, process, particularly to uh, the country's oil field, oil production, and indeed revenue at large? Well, the good news is that just like when you're trying to pump water through the holes, 
depending on the pressure, gradually it ramps up. What we understand that today, you're doing about 23,000 barrels of crude oil. Now, if my calculations are right, 10 um, Jubilee is doing around 80,000. So in the next few weeks, for, with respect to our total production from the two oil fields, we'll be doing a little over 130,000 barrels. And the good news is that they've learned all their lessons, and they are hoping that production will ramp up to about 50,000 by the end of the year. And so it means that they're going to produce more oil. The good thing also is that crude oil prices are picking up. So it means that revenue for Talo is going to improve. And don't forget that over the past few weeks, they've been having some shallow years, uh, dipping, losses, and all those things. The more profit the partners make, the more revenue the country gets in terms of taxes. Don't forget that if they're also expanding in terms of more exploration, they might need more hands. So you're talking about uh, personnel needed to help with this extraction. Mm. Also, don't forget that the country also needs more revenue from this. So in a long way, it has impact on revenue, it has impact on personnel, it impacts on Talo itself, don't forget they are listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. So, yeah. some good return for shareholders who have invested in this company. Right. Okay, so more jobs, more money. That's great news for all of us, I, I believe. But, uh, George, we'll be coming back to you when the president uh, touches base on the FPS. So, what you say will be, be in some 15 in minutes' next, time? Uh, We'll be doing that in the next 10 minutes, in the next 10 minutes, okay. or even 5 minutes, okay. if I'm right. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. George, many thanks for that very update. And uh, that was uh, my colleague with Joy Business, uh, uh, George Yafe, who joined us via Skype from uh, the FPSO at Tamils. Uh, he brought us some live visuals from the FPSO. And indeed, we are told now that the president should be arriving there in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. If he does arrive in time, uh, we will cross over and bring you a lot more on that uh, very important assignment. We do know that well, this is going to translate into a lot more jobs as well as uh, uh, a lot more money entirely for the country. You're still watching this desk here on the Journey Channel on Multi TV. Time now for break. When we, when we come back, we tell you some pretty interesting stories, including a feature that focuses on a female boxer. Uh, in one of the cities here in the capital, uh, one of the towns here in the capital, Accra, because uh, it's quite interesting for me because uh, she chose to drop out of school to focus on a career in boxing. I'll be back with those details. Stay with us. Here on your journey, Shalom Multi TV. Time now to do a few more stories. And many of those who give up when they encounter a challenge. But 18-year-old Leticia Ankara is not one of them. After dropping out of school at class three, she now wants to be one of the world's best female boxers. Maxwell Abakba has more. Her peers are in school studying. Her aspirations of becoming an engineer was truncated in class three. Like her friends, she is pregnant, not with a baby, but with big dreams, including becoming the world's best female boxer. It is 3 p.m. here in Jamestown. 18-year-old Leticia Ankara is getting ready to go and train. The inscription House of Pain on the wall of the training gym here is potent enough to ward off first-time visitors. Here in this building, Leticia gears up to take daily lessons in right and left jabs, blocks, hooks and more. Against this punching bag, she punches away her pain of dropping out of school. The desire to become a world champion is on course. Leticia cannot speak English, not what you even call broken English or pigeon. When I was in the I was in the castle. I was in the castle. I I stopped schooling in class three. I don't have anyone to support me. My mom sells rice and my dad is a fisherman. I do not enjoy any support from them. My parents did not show any interest in my education, so I decided to pursue a career in boxing. I will box till I grow old and weak. I want to be the best and travel all over the world. We all have choices. Some love football, others love tennis, and I love boxing.
Napoleon Ayatego is a former boxer and the owner of the Royal Power Boxing Gym where Leticia trains. Tego, who lost his eye during a bout, tells me some of the wrecks Leticia is likely to face. Juan Carlos Gomez, the former world champion in Germany. Which, which year was that? Yeah, uh, 11 December 1999. Mm. So what exactly happened on that? Yeah, day? that fight, I got this problem, high problem, uh, fifth round. I got this problem. It's, it's a sad call. So, um, the 14 seconds to the time, I, I, it, it broke, it punched me, and then boom, with the left uh, bow, down straight to my and Then I fall down. Then I woke up and I said, oh. from then I see my legs start shaking. After that, I see that I can't do anything. There are no plenty here, so I can not get fired. He trained with the men and the national team. He's always there. I saw him doing the training with the national team. So, he can sometimes fight with the, the men. So, how can you get a fight to fight? I can do that. Uh, there's a tournament. He won't get me. She won't get it. Uh, for me to get to fight. Napoleon Hills once said that do not be afraid of little opposition. Remember that a kite of success generally rises against the wind of adversity. That is exactly what Leticia Ankara is doing. Though she had her education truncated at class 3, she is determined to make it happen. Her hope is that one day she will achieve and attain the world's biggest feat in boxing. Reporting for Joy News, Maxwell Agbagba. A pretty deep report that is. Uh, we'll bring you a lot more on that also in subsequent bulletins. But away from that now to a rather sad story. And a four-year-old girl has died after fire burned down a two-story building at La Pamoy Junction here in Accra. The fire which began Wednesday afternoon. Is suspected to have been caused by leakage from a gas cylinder. If whatever is shown was at the scene, and now reports. These are not scrap dealers you see behind me. These are actually neighbors who are helping clear up this place after fire raised down a wooden structure here this afternoon. Properties where thousands of Ghana cities have been lost in this fire and a four-year-old girl have also lost her life in this fire. Residents looked on depressed and angry as people gathered on the scene struggling to help clear up the scene after the fire was put out. The wooden structure, according to residents, was put up 15 years ago and housed 15 people. Most of the occupants were not in the building when the fire started. However, a four-year-old girl was left to sleep in the building. I saw fire service, police and uh, soldiers putting water for the explaining everything. But, but I hear when they got here, the neighbors around here had already put out the fire. Yes, yeah, they are also trying and put off for the fire. But they couldn't, so only the fire service people come before they done it. So already the, the daughter has died inside, inside. Okay, tell me about this wooden structure. When was it put up? Uh, the stru this building structure was uh, building almost 15 years now. Oh, it's been here for 15 years? No, 15, 15 years now. And uh, it's a, a study building, a structure study building for... And a year with a down one, including this this place. Yeah. Okay. All been. You were here when the incident occurred. What happened? Oh, we are here uh, playing like jokers. And one of uh, my friend, junior daughter, he went to the room and then he said it's a fire there. Before he came and called us, they said the, the whole thing is burning. The mother of the deceased collapsed on her way back home upon hearing that her daughter had died. The other occupants are in despair because they lost everything they have worked years for. As a, a branch secretary here, uh, and I have a documents and a lot of people that, you know, in our area. So when a thing happened, I can't you know, think about myself alone. I have to think about uh, my other brothers who are, you know, sisters and brothers who are staying in the area. So that's the problem I have. 
The police as well as fire service personnel had already left the scene when the news team arrived. Ifwa Evans Chinui for Joy News. Well, in a bit, we'll be bringing you some business, but... Uh,